Okay, so this is uh, the first ever uh, video uh, podcast for this less on podcast. I am uh, your host, Danny Pinto. Follow us on uh, on Twitter here at Sless on Pod. Um, you know, with the with the Euros uh, coming up here in in just over a month, um, you know, I I started thinking about you know what what could we be doing uh, leading up to uh, leading up to uh, to the Euros and and you know in in the hopes of Portugal and our beloved Sless song. Uh, repeating as european champions and you know obviously euro 2016 was the 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 cap to an amazing run in that tournament and in a much much uh awaited trophy was finally won but today uh with our esteemed uh, panel here we want to talk about uh the almosts the the what could have beens and uh we're going to be discussing uh the semifinalists the five semifinalists and the uh, the one finalist um, that could have brought a, a trophy to Portugal uh, before 2016. And I have the authors of the 13th chapter. From Uzebu to Ronaldo, Portugal's 50-year journey from football minnows to European champions. Here's the book. I've uh, I've tabbed it because I, I loved it a lot, and I went over it a lot. Um, but uh, but the authors are here. Uh, Nathan Motes, Tom Cundert, and Simon Curtis uh, just Wonderful to have all three of you here, guys, and and thank you for making uh, what is multiple time zones and uh, and multiple areas of uh, of the world to make this uh, this first video uh, happen to, here. So uh, so I thank all three of you for for joining me today. You're Good welcome. Stuff, Danny. Thank you, thank you for setting it up. Absolutely. So first, before we we get into the uh, the semifinals and the and the teams that we'll be discussing, just um, you know, how did the three of you get together? Uh, to make the 13th chapter a reality? Well, uh, we'd had this idea, you know, we'd all contributed to uh, Portugal.net, the site, and uh, Simon, like me, has lived in Portugal for, you know, quite a few years now. And we'd had this idea of, uh, you know, writing a book about Portuguese national team. And uh, we kind of got, you know, more and more... Um, kind of, uh, you know, discussed it and said, yeah, come on, let's get this done. And uh, we dragged our feet a little bit, but finally uh, kind of decided how we're going to organize it. Uh, you know, we're going to organize it into chapters. Each We designated certain tournaments for uh, to each author. And it just kind of came about. And as luck would have it, uh, it was originally planned to be uh, published before 2016 as a kind of aperitif to that tournament or for you know to really get people in the mood and try and kind of catch the, the enthusiasm going into that tournament but uh you know one thing led to another we kind of uh, started getting some really good materials some really good interviews and so we delayed uh basically the publication a bit and then what happens uh portugal go and win euro 2016 so that was uh you know that made our delay perfect in a way because uh we kind of restructured the book a little bit to make it like you said the journey to uh the culmination which was uh, you know the thing which made all portuguese football fans just euphoric all over the world of uh, actually finally winning the trophy uh in 2016 so you know it's kind of a you could say a passion project i know that's a uh, a phrase you like to use danny uh for your uh, absolutely your brilliant podcast and so I suppose you could stay, say that but it kind of turned into something a bit more serious I would say a bit more than just a hobby and uh yeah you know really pleased with the end end result kind of the gods came together and more importantly than ever than anything you know Portugal really decided you know that there's these three guys writing a book about us our national team let's go and win it for them and uh that's exactly what they did <laughs> The stars aligned. Absolutely. Uh, Simon, uh, you know, I've had Nathan and Tom on uh, my podcast multiple times, and I'm so happy to finally get you on as well. Um, you know, b between you and I, it, Tom's very difficult to work with, right? He's pretty difficult. Pretty <laughs> difficult. Yes. I, I feed him plenty of these and he calms down a bit usually. A sing. Yes, sir. <laughs> Wonderful. How was what was how was your experience uh, working on uh, on this? This book? is just a disguise. This is a disguise. Okay. Yeah, th yes, and this is, is and this is vodka. It was, it was interesting what Tom was saying there because uh, when he said as luck would have it, I thought he was going to say as luck would have it, 
Simon was ancient enough to take on the early chapters that the, the rest of us couldn't remember, but in fact, he was going to make a different point, so that's okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I learned about 66 and 84 from this book, so it's uh, it's it's a good thing. Nathan, As uh, I'll go to you here. As, as someone who uh, you know, like myself from the States and, you know, you've, you've told me before, I think even on our first interview on the podcast where you're not Portuguese, you don't have any Portuguese ties really. And you kind of fell in love with the team in the early two thousands. Um, what was the experience like being a part of, uh, of a project like this? Yeah. I mean, I, I felt a little bit like the odd man out in that sense. I think it was, uh, a little, a little less comfortable being kind of the a late arriver, uh, rival to, to Portuguese football. And, um, you know, I think the story just wrote itself, you know, as really was compelling about is this, this team, this, this nation, you know, Portugal was just their story was so good, you know, and, and no one had told it, you know, in, in English, you know, and it was, um, it was too good to pass up in that sense. You know, I've been fortunate enough to be, uh, in Europe a few times seeing, uh, in, in person, you know, the plight of the Sal Sal and, and it was, um, you know, it was an honor to be able to document that for posterity. You know, I, I'll always feel that way. Um, and, and I'm glad a lot of people have, have received it so well. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, before we, before we get going on, uh, on the, on the review here of, of the, of the six squads, we'll talk about, uh, Simon, I had asked you this, uh, prior to the, uh, to the interview beginning, but, um, as someone who jumped on Twitter years ago, uh, for, um, to, to get an English, view of Portuguese football to, uh, to be able to understand it better. Um, you were one of the first folks that I found on Twitter because of your Twitter handle, which is <laughs> be funna, be funna. Uh, what's the origin of that? And, uh, and one, I can't believe it wasn't, maybe be funna was taken and you had to go twice to, to make sure you got it. But what's the origin of the, of the Twitter handle be funna, be funna. It's, it's much deeper and much more involved than that, Danny, I can tell you. <laughs> it, it goes back to the 2010 World Cup in South Africa. And the Guardian newspaper in the UK asked me to report on Portugal's games. Um, they were launching a new way of reporting on tournaments, and that was the what we now have and expect to have every time. These live feeds with up-to-the-minute comment um, as the games are going on between the games and lots of input on on a sort of scrolling website um, 2010 was the first time they did it and they asked me to be the the, the Portuguese reporter if you like um, but we had to get a handle to go on Twitter um, so I thought well it's Bafana Bafana was the the name of the South African national squad of course it was for, for the 2010 World Cup Portugal were going. Bifanas are what we eat before we go into the ground in Portugal. So it had to be Bifana Bifana and it's stuck ever since. That's awesome. What that's a that's a very cool story. I'm glad I'm glad uh I'm glad you have it. Yeah, because uh, I mean it's <laughs> it's again, it was one of the first I'm like, who is Bifana Bifana? And it's uh, his name is Simon Curtis, and that threw me off first because I'm well, this doesn't it doesn't sound Portuguese, but uh, you know, following you and, and Nathan and Tom since uh, since then, it's been it's been awesome uh, for every anyone who's who's trying to follow the team. Uh, on, on the English speaking side of the world. So, well, it, it uh, fitted quite nicely at the time, Danny, but obviously now I have to explain myself. And I, I <laughs> occasionally get South Africans on Twitter uh, coming at me and saying, Look, you oaf, it's Bafana Bafana. <laughs> Um, and I have to, I have to go through the whole ex, whole explanation. No, it goes from 2010. They've gone by then, of course. But uh, I'm, I'm often told that I'm misspelling Bafana Bafana. <laughs> yeah, there are worse. There are worse things in uh, in the world, I guess, to to have to to have to explain. But uh, well, well, let's let's get started. And and Simon, we will start with you uh, with uh, with uh, World Cup uh, nineteen sixty six. Uh, not because of your age. How dare you? It's uh, it's Absolutely. because it's it's because it's it's the part of the chat or the part of the book. This is your chapter. Obviously, uh, this is Portugal's first. Uh, you know, their debut on the international stage uh, of uh, of international football. You know, Benfica, Sporting Port had, had done had, had done some things um, in, in, in on the club scene. Obviously, Benfica with some uh, some titles in the '60s, but this was the first time that the world was going to see a national team on the world stage. 
Um, they had wins against Hungary, Bulgaria, and Brazil in group play, the historic comeback against uh, North Korea in the quarters, and then losing to England in the semis. But um, Uzebu is the is the, is the key piece here um, from a historical point of view in terms of world football. But um, kind of give me a little bit of a, of a background as to how this 66 squad came to be and, uh, and just your thoughts on the squad uh, in general. Well, I think this was a time in Portugal where it was just so exciting to be part of a, a finals tournament. Uh, first time, as they say, is always the best, um, whatever it is we're talking about. And I think participation in finals tournaments probably uh, is relevant in that as well. It, it just produced some of the most iconic memories and images and games um, that the Portuguese national team has ever been um, involved in, I would say. Uh, right from the start, we got something spectacular. We got an avalanche of goals from them. We got um, the, the the world becoming aware of, of superstars. Eusebio was just out of this world. Uh, nine goals in the six games to be top scorer in the tournament. Um, the images created, the, the type of goals he scored, smashing him, them in from all angles. He was just on top of his game. Um, probably not seen anything to compare with that uh, up to Cristiano Ronaldo in modern times. And uh, I would argue that he still hasn't been surpassed in some, some respects. So it was just the, the birth of the new, if you like, the, the just incredibly exciting to be going to England, the, the cradle of the game and taking part, especially being drawn in, a, in such a strong group, playing in the north of England, uh, in Liverpool and Manchester, where the crowds were fervent and really supportive, big 50, 60,000 crowds for every game, and a, a well-balanced group, Hungary, Bulgaria, Brazil, and still managing to come out of that, not just come out of it, but but knock each one for three goals, uh, fantastic performances as a, as a debutant in the, in the, in the tournament. Um, but it wasn't over then, you know, I think that would probably have been enough for the for the Portuguese beating heart at that stage, but it just got better and better. That that incredible game with North Korea that everybody now talks about because of the the comeback, the Eusebio comeback, if you like, uh, to come back to win it 5-3 after looking like they were dead and buried. Um, a titanic semi-final with the hosts at Wembley, which again produced such iconic images, Eusebio crying at the end and being, um, consoled by famous English figures like Bobby Charlton and uh, Bobby Moore. Um, we, we spoke, Tom and I spoke to Antonio Simois about that tournament. Um, and he, he spoke so warmly about it, you know, great memories, especially of what Coluna and Eusebio did for the team. They just dragged that, those players from game to game. There were hardly any changes in the lineups throughout that tournament. So, um, important to to make a note of that i think because these days you know with squad rotation and and careful planning you can you can pick certain games where you think okay we're going to rest someone for this game and he'll be good for the quarter final or whatever it is they played almost identical 11s throughout that tournament which is probably why sadly they ran out of steam against england in the semi final simois told us that they they were just they they were dead on their legs basically um, but still, they managed another titanic game uh, in the 2-1 defeat to, to England. Um, it, just an incredible tournament, incredible uh, entry to world football, if you like, leaving so many warm memories and, and, I guess, waking people up to the fact that this little nation could play bloody good football. You know, it, in the book, uh, I think Antonio Simões mentions, you know, you know, uh, the I guess the only critique he would have of uh, of the manager would be, if we're up three one, if we're up three nil, why not, you know, save save some legs for the last fifteen twenty minutes, and maybe it yeah. could have, you know, you, it could have it could have uh, put uh, put Portugal through. He's he's of the opinion that Portugal had every opportunity to win this tournament, um, yes. and it just didn't it, it just didn't fall that way. Um, uh, you mentioned in the book uh, that it, in, I, I don't know if it was the English Federation. I have to, I'd have to look back on the book, but the the change of venue of the semifinal uh, mm -hmm. from uh, from Liverpool to Manchester. Um, 
how how big of a of an impact do you think that was um in, in the grand scope of of Portugal maybe not being able to to get through? Well, the change of venue was to Wembley, in fact. To Wembley, it, I'm it, sorry, yes. Took it took it south to Wembley, which was made a big difference, of course, because Portugal had played all the games in the northwest of England, uh, built up a, a rapport with the locals, uh, because England hadn't been playing uh, anywhere but Wembley. So the tournament was being enjoyed by northern folk um, by the closeness they could get to the teams that were playing there. So there was already that rapport with the with the the football supporters of the northwest of England. And because it had, it had been such a romantic journey and a romantic tournament, an exciting tournament, blistering football from them, uh, they'd taken to them. There was a, a great rapport between the, the, the people of the, the Northwest and the Portuguese squad. Then they were told at the last moment that uh, it was being shifted to Wembley and that, that left a very sour taste, I'm afraid. Um, obviously, the English, well, this couldn't happen anymore, but the English were, were keen to get it played in a in their home stadium if you like where the crowd would be bigger and fervently behind the home side and that made a big difference that that and the tiredness i think when you step out at wembley feeling a little bit wronged you notice the tight muscles even more then you think well we're really sure. up against it now it's the home nation hundred thousand people shouting their their uh, hearts out for the for the english and um we don't feel that this is quite right and now we're knackered as well still they put up a good fight a really good fight so mag if you watch the the game in full it's a magnificent game of to and fro up and down uh, but they just didn't have the legs they didn't have anything left to give we're talking with the authors of the 13th chapter from Uzebu to Ronaldo, Portugal's 50-year journey from football minnows to European champions. They are Tom Cundert, Nathan Motes, and Simon Curtis. As uh, you're listening to uh, our first and watching, I guess, our first ever uh, video uh, podcast here of the Celeste podcast, uh, I'm your host, Danny Pinto. Uh, Tom, I I'll, I'll go to you here uh, in terms of your interview and the, the book's interview with Antonio Simões. Um what was it like to get a first-hand account of that debutante, uh, that debutante team uh, from someone who, who, who lived it? Oh, amazing, yeah, amazing. One of my favorite interviews, for sure, and is such a eloquent and well-spoken and, I think, modest, uh, well, without a doubt, such a, uh, a modest man. You know, we're talking about, uh, you know, one of Portugal's all-time greats. He's not really talked about that much as one of Portugal's all-time greats, but he should be. Uh, he also holds the record, by the way, as the youngest ever player uh, to win a European Cup for Benfica, you know, and he still holds that record 50-odd you know, years later. So, you know, it just tells you what a special player he is. And, uh, you know, it's really interesting what he said. Uh, what he said to us, uh, He's, I think it was very revealing. I think we've got some really good information from him. And, but I think that one thing that's really stood out was the way he talked about Eusebio, because, of course, he was, a, as well as being a, a teammate of Eusebio's at Benfica and for Portugal, he was a great friend of Eusebio. They were, they remained, you know, great friends right until uh, Eusebio's uh, passing. And, uh, you know, the way he, he, he spoke about him and he kind of, you know, you could revered him to such an extent, uh, just called him a genius and, uh, you know, time and again you really could tell that he was you know that was a special relationship so it was nice to get a little window on that as well but like I say I think just his uh I think really his his grace and his his elegance I mean talking about it's very interesting talking about the switch which uh Simon just uh, discussed there I remember he himself he did say yes you know that was uh you know something which wouldn't happen nowadays and but he didn't really put too much store in it, did he, Simon? And he, he actually said, he actually said, you know, fair. I don't, I don't think it was because he was just speaking to us and we, and we were English and he knew that. But he did actually say, you know, I think uh, at the end of that semi-final, you know, it was a great match. But I think England did deserve to win because, you know, we just didn't quite have the legs in the end. Uh, you know, it wasn't like it wasn't a robbery or something. And he didn't really dwell on that, on, on the venue switch, which... Uh, you know, he, he could have done, which, you know, legitimately he could have kind of hammered that home. So, what, yeah, you what know. For, what for me was incredible, if I can just interrupt, Tom, was, yeah. was sitting next to someone um, who Tom describes expertly and, and accurately, but sitting there listening to someone who had been on 
the Wembley pitch in the 1966 World Cup semi-final, sharing the pitch with Eusebio, with Coluna, with Bobby Charlton, Bobby Moore, Gordon Banks, and telling the stories of what was happening during the game, the ebb and flow, um, just incredible. It, it just gave you a, a tingling sensation down the back of your neck, you know, to, to hear the, the, the little tales of just who was tackling who and who was doing what during the game. And to think we were sat next to this guy who'd just been in one of the most iconic Portuguese games ever, you know, fantastic. Yeah, and it's really just just one thing to add also, uh, which maybe uh, I suppose the viewers can make up their minds at the end, and maybe even <laughs> ourselves, we can help, her, uh, you know, help us with our assessment. But he he did say, it. I did I did kind of note, uh, I wouldn't say it was a resentment in a way, but a little bit of uh, he thinks that the achievements which which his team did in 1966 are a little bit underplayed in Portugal. And I agree with that definitely because I suppose a lot of it just has to do with, you know, the evolution of media and there's so much information and uh, so much footage isn't there about all the recent tournaments and we go in, we analyse it to death. And of course that didn't happen in 1966. So it tends to get a little bit forgotten, but that was an absolutely incredible achievement by Portugal. As Simon said, you know, that was Portugal's first ever tournament. You look at the group they were in, you know, they, they knocked out Brazil. Brazil won the two previous World Cups. They'd, w- they'd win the, the World Cup after 1966. You know, they were the undisputed kings of the game at that time. And Portugal beat them and beat them brilliantly. You know, if you say you're just scoring that incredible goal, uh, Simon described it really well in the in the book, you know, it's really one of one of the iconic goals. I don't know, actually, Simon, I don't know if you know this off the top of your head, but is that perhaps Brazil's only defeat in, in four World Cups? Uh, you know, it must if it's not their only defeat, then it must be one of their only defeats because they could, they could well they be. Won. Yes, I don't know for a fact, yeah. but yes, could we? Could well uh, be. They were, yeah, they won the two previous ones and they won in 1970. So, yeah, you know, no doubt about it. You know, it was a, an incredible team, that 1966 uh, Portugal team. There's another astonishing fact that I'm not sure whether uh, you you picked up, but in the squad was a chap called Manuel Duarte, who played for Le Chois. And I'm pretty sure it's the only World Cup, World Cup squad ever in the history of football to contain a footballer from Le Chois football football team. <laughs> so that again gives yeah. it a little bit of a legacy edge, I would say. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you know, Nathan, I, I know that this part of uh, of Portuguese history is not one that you and I lived through uh, or, or researched. Yeah, 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 yeah. Not me either. I, I wasn't, you know, I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, but as someone who, who fell in love with this Portuguese side uh, in the in the 2000s, uh, how was, you know, you know, learning about 66 and, and we'll talk about 84 here uh, after, but learning uh, of the uh, of the initial um, entry into international football for for uh, this lesson how was that uh for you just getting a you know kind of learning about that uh in your in your uh in your uh, writing and then uh, research as well yeah i mean i i think it was important just to uh to experience that before before going into my sections kind of seeing portugal as not as uh kind of how they were they were introduced to me in the early 2000s is like this upstart you know you know, football and minnow type nation, but, you know, decades prior, you know, Portugal had made a, a, a shocking entrance into international football, you know, and that, that's the legacy of Portugal. It's not, it's not really of this nation that didn't qualify for tournaments, you know, for several decades after 1966, you know, I, I know that's in our history as well, but with the, the, the potential that Portugal had as a nation was obvious from the beginning. You know, I mean, as soon as we showed up at that tournament, we had business and we had great players. No one even knew you know, at the time, you know, there, there was no way of knowing exactly what, you know, was going to show up other than maybe Eusebio and a couple of the players. And so I think that um, being introduced to that, you know, decades later, as I was writing about the, the 06 tournament in particular, um, that that's in the past of, the, of this team. It was always there. It was always a part of, you know, uh, Portugal's, you know, present and, and their future as well. And, and, and it kind of the way that I wrote my chapters was very much a matter of kind of like looking at what was being done in 2000s as an attempt to culminate the work of the 66 squad, not just something new or mm-hmm. 
and that they originated themselves, but it was something that they were doing to consecrate the achievement, you know, of, of the 66 squad of Eusebio, who unfortunately, you know, wasn't able to, to do it himself, you know? And so I, I looked at it in that sense and it was really, it was humbling and it really helped focus the intent of the writing for me. You know, you, you mentioned, you know, decades, um, before it would t- it would be almost two decades until we would see Portugal on the international stage again, uh, again in a in a debutante role in 1984 as they would qualify uh, for their first European Championship in 1984. Um, <laughs> this part of the book, and and, and Simon, this is uh, you authored this part too. But uh, in our in leading up to setting up this uh, this uh, this interview and, and this discussion. Um, one of the first things you told me is like, I, I cannot wait to talk about 1984. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, I, in reading, in reading, you know, the, the chapters, uh, that we're discussing today, um, you know, we, lo- we love, uh, you know, I, I as, of, as someone of Portuguese descent, I mean, the Sles song is my number one team. All I want is the best for this team. All I want for them to do is show, uh, the footballing world, how good they are. But when you can peek behind the curtain, which you so brilliantly did in this chapter, and I even talked to my 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 dad about this, and there were some things that he was not aware of, uh, of just the the turmoil that found a way to the semifinals <laughs> is 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 a way I looked at it, um, and almost forcing an opportunity to get to the finals against uh, against France, but. This was to me the most interesting read of of any of the chapters in the book, just because of just how what's the word I'm looking? At? It was just so unpredictable, and you wouldn't have thought that it could be possible with the relationships uh, just crumbling and being non-existent on a personal and professional level. But somehow they found a way to make it gel on the field 84 is just uh, is just such a a great story <laughs> well the chickens came home home to roost really in 86 um yeah. it was all all there to see in 84 but as you as you said danny they they managed to paper over the cracks and by dint of uh, a number of different factors coming together um uh, got to the semi-finals but you're right. It was it was a, a strange old time. I'd, I'd like to show you this. this is a oh cracking... wow! Oh, Mister Quatrecabezas. Yep. <laughs> this was what it was all about, wasn't it? Um, we didn't even have a manager. You know, we had four. We had a committee um, arguing about who should be in the team, and one of them was biased towards Porto. One was biased towards Benfica. Of course, one was biased towards Sporting. And they just argued and argued. They had their favourites. One wanted one fellow in, one wanted the other. So this is no way to approach a finals tournament, obviously, especially your your debut in the Euros this time. Um, But it came together. And thanks to, again, a a fantastic bunch of players, uh, Portugal put their their footprint firmly on the Euros in 84, um, culminating in what I would say probably the best game of football I've ever seen, certainly the best international game of football I've ever seen, certainly live, um, because I was old enough to see the 84 tournament live. 66, no, thank you very much, Tom. (laughs) But 84, I was in my element. I was a a teenager loving football to bits, and this was really my first viewing of Portugal and what they could do. And to see the, the silky skills of Shalana, and the forward play of Jordão and Diamantino and Gomes oh, was fantastic. And as I say, they, they they did what they needed to do in the group. It's only a small tournament in those days, a nice compact tournament, not like the the megaliths we have these days, which go on for weeks and weeks and weeks. Nobody knows who's going through and who isn't. In fact, everybody's going through usually. <laughs> um, in those days, each game counted, and you 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 had to concentrate. Um, and the culmination of that was this fantastic balmy evening in Marseille, in the Stade Velodrome, one of the most atmospheric grounds in Europe, packed to the rafters, everybody in in white shirts or no shirts at all, steaming hot Cote d'Azur evening, 
the atmosphere bubbling to a complete climax as this game just took off and swerved in every direction possible with the, the a fantastically talented French team expected really to wipe the floor with Portugal but very nearly going out with their tails between their legs so close to uh, an incredible result for, for Portugal um, to be 2-1 up in extra time with uh, an admittedly slightly strange goal from Jordão, the, the, the old curious bounce and into the back of the net. What drama, just dripping in drama. Um, and then the culmination, unfortunately, uh, against Portugal on that occasion, but still, I, I can still hear the, the BBC commentator as I was watching the game in England as a kid, screaming uncontrollably uh, when the winning goal went in that this was the best football match he'd ever seen. And I, I had to agree with him. I, I had to agree with him. And the legacy is not just probably the best ever game. The the beginning of um, seeing more than one great player because Eusebio, for all the Antonio Simois and the Colunas, Eusebio was, was totally dominant in 66 in that squad. Here we had uh, more good players and more good players around the team. Um, so that was a different kind of legacy as well. And also the legacy that we have to remember, I said at the, at the beginning to you, Danny, that it's not all about good things. You know, we, we have to learn from the bad moments as well. And the 84, 86 era certainly showed us an, a, a football federation that was at best disinterested and possibly more accurately just in complete disarray. Um, and from there, lessons had to be learned. And from there, we now have a professionally run football organization in this country. And you can see the difference. You know, from there, we've had a line of almost um, limitless qualifications for, for major tournaments. You know, one of, the, uh, one of the things that I found most interesting in reading about uh, the 84 team was you know, you had the two draws against uh, West Germany and Spain, and then you had the the all important victory against Romania to qualify to the semis. But it was in the semifinal where Shalana was injured. Yes, and you know the uh, you know the old school mentality back then, and uh, which is something that is not really existent nowadays, is you know you had your your Port clicks, you had your Benfica clicks, you had your Sporting clicks, and that was something that was, you know, under uh, underlining was an underlining of just how dysfunctional that squad was. However, when it got to the field, something where something like an injury to arguably the best player of that tournament for Portugal, um, where you know people were questioning, oh, he shouldn't be in, I should be playing, and vice versa. There seemed to be a togetherness that came from that moment that carried over through the rest of that match and onto the semifinal. Um, how, I, I, to simply put it, how weird of a combination is that to have such disarray on one end and then be able to uh, to just come together? And, well, pretty and pretty put, weird and put is it, the answer, yeah. I think. Pretty <laughs> weird is the answer. Um, but it often happens, you know, out of out of adversity, some some groups pull it together and and do their best work, and that's what happened in '84. Um, it, it mustn't mustn't be forgotten that those group games, although it looked a little bit dour, there weren't so many goals like the Avalanche in '66. Um, those were good teams they were they were playing. They were playing West Germany, um, who were. World Cup finalists two years before that and holders of the Euro European tournament from 1980. So that was not an easy ask to play in the same group as them. Um, Spain, of course, were a growing power at that time as well. So they did incredibly well, uh, starting in the in the, the messy situation that they had to to actually come through that group at all. But then to, to tail it off with that stupendous game against France was just just something else for me. Tom and Nathan, I'll I'll ask you guys, uh, you know, of the eighty uh, from the eighty four squad, what are kind of your 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 uh, I guess talking points of you know the the legacy of that eighty four team? 
Yeah, well, it's really interesting what you, your question there, Danny, because it's, I think you just put your, your finger on it because it can't really be understated how dysfunctional the, the whole setup was. I mean, literally, you had these clicks, your Porto click and your Benfica click. And the, I think Simon describes it in the book, you know, literally, they would have their own tables and their tables would be, uh, you know, so they could turn their backs on, on the others. You know, you think that it's incredible how that just kind of came together. I suppose at the end of the day, they just thought, you know, the the country, isn't it? The country that, that at the end of the day, they're playing for their nation. And so kind of patriotic values, whatever came to the fore. But yeah, you know, they, you know, the, the whole history of Portuguese football, really, there's such this, this, right? It's one thing which makes Portuguese football great, but it's also one thing which makes Portuguese football which causes a lot of the problems which afflict it. There's just such a fierce rivalry among the teams. And like Simon said, that has been kind of ironed out at the level of the Selecao nowadays. And I think that's that shows you perhaps, you know, what Portugal have achieved in this, in this century. Uh, it makes you think perhaps what they could have achieved or what they should have achieved in, in the previous century, you know, if this, if this kind of schism didn't exist. Uh, but yeah, you know, just as for the football itself, uh, you know, absolutely unbelievable. And that match, which, uh, you know, which Simon talks so eloquently about, it, it really is just uh, an absolute, like let's say in Portugal, um hino, uh, a football. It's just like a, a hymn to football. It's absolutely amazing, you know, great, great to watch from start to finish. It's repeated quite often here in Portugal and never get bored of watching it. <laughs> Yeah, Nathan. What about you? What what uh, what kind of uh, what kind of notes or uh, takes do you take from that eighty four squad? Yeah, I mean, um, I don't know that I can add anything better than what the uh, the others have said, except for you know, it, it's just a, an example of uh, <laughs> it reminds me of a, a famous uh, quote from a, from a very wise man, uh, Ricardo Quaresma, who said that talent is not everything. You know, and it doesn't matter what you pitch if there's all kinds of other issues off of it uh, that that prevent the, the progress of the team together. Uh, th it doesn't matter. And I think we've seen that really throughout the history of the cell I was interested in the book. You kept seeing different things come up that would like derail what was otherwise a really uh, hopeful prospect for success in a national tournament. For example, in Euro 2008, when Scolari uh, just declared he was going to be Chelsea's manager right in the middle of it. You know, I mean, I, I don't think that was the only reason why Portugal lost to Germany in the, in the quarterfinals, but I don't think it helped. I'll say it that way. And so uh, a, very, a much a much more minor issue, of course, than having uh, club feuds show up in the national team squad, of course. But the moral being, I think that Portugal learned from that in, in the decades that followed in a way that, uh, you know, eventually was a part of the ultimate success that was achieved at Euro 2016. Yeah, I uh, you know I I uh, turned forty in in December, and and my my first uh, memories of this last song was the '86 team in Mexico, and uh, in in reading about you know from '84 to '86 what <laughs> what I was kind of starting to look into, and then uh, as we as we move now to uh, to Euro 2000, where everything started going the golden generation's way in terms of meeting expectations to a certain extent by just the culmination of, of being able to have this golden generation on display in a in a world tournament at Euro 2000. Uh, Tom, mm -hmm. this is uh, this is one that you authored here on uh, in the book and um, you know there was you know this was the first of a, a handful of famous victories in international competition against England. obviously that first one in the in the group uh, in the group match uh, where they won three two. They would defeat Romania. They would defeat Germany on a uh, on a, uh, a hat trick from Sergio Conceição. Uh, would beat Turkey in the quarters and uh, would be uh, would be meeting France once again in the semis. Normally that doesn't go really well. History will show you once you find France in the semis if you're Portugal. But um, talk uh, talk to us about uh, again the, what kind of was you know the background of that 2000 squad obviously with the golden generation being at the forefront of of the of the topics and uh what we uh, what you took from uh, from that tournament uh, in 2000 yeah yeah you're right it really was the you know the, the famous golden generation the, the the first i suppose you could say true golden generation it's been repeated so often even nowadays you know they say there's a new portuguese golden generation which perhaps is true but 
the original one was this one, which uh, won two back-to-back -back World Youth uh, World Cups in uh, I think 89 and 91. And it was, of course, at the heart of it, Luis Figo and Rui Costa. Uh, you know, they were kind of the really the flag bearers for the golden generation. And this was really the tournament where they could, you know, uh, they were at their peak. It was, I think this tournament was a little different to all previous ones from Portugal, Portugal's uh, fans' point of view, in that they went into it probably quite confident that they could do well. You know, 1966, debut tournament, obviously, uh, as we talked about, you know, all the problems afflicting the Celestial in previous tournaments. And so I don't think Portuguese fans ever really went into a tournament with, with too much hope. I think that was different this time because Portugal, you know, they're in even in the 96 Euro, they put in some good performances. And so, and, you know, Figo was, I think, World Player of the Year. Uh, he was the reigning World Player of the Year. So, or maybe he was at the, at the end of 2000, yeah, I think he was Crown World Player of the Year. So they were really at the top of their game. You know, these were, we're talking about now, you know, players really, uh, you know, some of the best players in the world representing Portugal. Having said that, on the negative side, of course, Portugal, as is their want, usually got drawn into an absolutely horrible group, or is seen, you know, a group of death with uh, Germany and England. And so immediately, uh, again, this is, I think, you know, a running theme of people who, who read the book, uh, when Portugal aren't really favoured that much generally from the general kind of media, uh, you know, perception, and maybe perhaps even fans from outside of Portugal, is when they really, you know, tend to come to the fore and show show what they can do, and that was definitely the case here. And you know, that first game against uh, against England, I mean, uh, Simon spoke, uh, you know, so well about the Portugal France game as being one of the best ever international ones. This one wasn't too far behind it, I don't think. An absolutely, you know, brilliant game. Perhaps not uh, in terms of quality. Perhaps didn't quite hit that, you know, kind of Tigana and Platini doing their stuff, but. Uh, you know, this was a good England team and they went 2-0 up, uh, you know, had a, you know, it's the, the team with Rio Ferdinand and uh, was it uh, Michael Owen, was it, or McManaman, uh, you know, they had a lot of, they had their own kind of golden generation in that era and they went 2-0 up and it all seemed to be going a bit, uh, you know, pear-shaped for Portugal, but that magnificent comeback uh, really kind of infused Portugal and set the tone for the tournament and, uh, there was really no looking back from that. Uh, you know, the Nuno Gomes, of course, he was very young at that time, pretty much unknown outside of Portugal. Just, uh, you know, had a brilliant first game. He actually only played because uh, Sao Pinto and Pauleta, uh, you know, the, the first two striker choices, they were unavailable. I think one was, one was suspended, the other was injured. And, uh, but, you know, he scored that brilliant winning goal to cap off an, an amazing comeback. And then it was just, uh, you know, no stopping Portugal from there. Like you mentioned, the, the third group game when Portugal were already qualified. So uh, Umberto Coelho, the coach, completely changed the team, uh, came up against Germany and just absolutely swatted them aside 3-0. That amazing hat trick from Sergio Conceição. And so, uh, so yeah, it was a, you know, a brilliant tournament. And like you said, uh, you know, Portugal, again, I'd say like 66 when Portugal, it's, it's curious actually when you look back at it, 66, Portugal lost to the eventual winners, England. 84, Portugal lost to the eventual winners, France. This one, 2000, Portugal again lost to the eventual winners, France, who, like I was mentioning how, you know, Brazil were probably the strongest side in the world in 66. You could probably at this time, France were the strongest side in the world. You know, they'd won the World Cup in 98 and uh, they, they won this tournament as well. So they were, you know, reigning your world and European champions. And, you know, they we also have to, uh, you know, that, 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 the way that game ended leaves a bit of a bitter taste in, in the mouth of, uh, you know, Portugal fans. But we also have to recognise that that also was a very special uh, France team. I think I remember the interview we did with Nuno Gomes and one thing always uh, really uh, kind of uh, resonated with me or stuck, stuck in my mind was I asked him about, uh, of course, a lot of the, the focus was on Figo and you know what a big influence he was at Portugal at the time. And I said, well, also for France, they had one of the best players in the world, Zidane, possibly the best player in the world at that moment. You know, what, what are your thoughts on him? 
And he just kind of sat back in his chair and he said, you know what, when I played against Zidane, he said in this game and also in Italy, because he also went to Italy, I was uh, his opponent. But sometimes I just kind of looked at him and you just had to admire him. You know, I just had to say, what a player. This player is just incredible, you know, and he was playing against him. And so, uh, yeah, I think Portugal, you know, this, again, what you mentioned at the start, I think this was really the tournament. It's really the turning point for Portugal. From this moment onwards, they became, you know, a real serious force. Uh, as much as much as for the players themselves, I think they really believed it. They really believed that they could go head to head with everyone after this tournament. And so, uh, yeah, and also the, you know, very, very exciting football. Of course, it, it's, it's one which, which coined the phrase sexy football. Uh, I think it was Rude Gullit who mentioned that on, uh, uh, or, or was that 96? That might have been 96. Yeah, 96. But this was kind of the era where Portugal were known as, you know, the, the side which plays sexy football or kind of Brazil of Europe, you know, and uh, it all came together at this tournament for sure. You know the you know the the famous goal obviously is the, is the goal that Luis Figue hits from I don't know some thirty yards away. Um, obviously, Nuno Gomes has the game winner in that opening match uh, against England. But I think a goal that does not get the credit it deserves is the is the game tying goal that Joan Pint from Pinto. a ridiculous ridiculous angle finds it, it glances off his head and just finds a way to. To not only get Portugal back level, but I think that goal kind of fired up the team. I mean, the the fee goal was unbelievable, but that goal, I guess, like just kind of resonated with that with that squad, maybe for the rest of the tournament because of just the absolute world class skill that it took to score. I think it was I think uh, Hui Costa is the one that uh, that sent the ball in, and I I've seen just, I've seen that goal over and over again, and I yeah. just I can't I can't fathom how that goal goes in and the absolute world class touch that it took to get to to get that. Uh, I have to, I have goal. to tell yeah. you, Danny, that that was the occasion where I I came up close to the Portuguese national team for the first time. I moved to Portugal in uh, late 1999, um, so I was here in Lisbon for that tournament, and it's the first big tournament that I I saw in Portugal. Um, and that particular night against England will stick it in my mind for all time because a friend of mine ran a, a, a mock English pub at uh, Kais Sodre down by the river on, on the riverside in Lisbon. And that night, um, HMS something or other, a, a British naval frigate had turned up at the docks. So his pub was swarming with what we will call military personnel uh, trying, trying their best to get as drunk as possible. The rest of the clientele were obviously local, so a lot of Portuguese packed in there. Great excitement. And that game, uh, it was my, my first night as a professional pundit because I told anyone who would listen to me, don't worry about Nuno Gomes and João Pinto. The pair of them never, ever score. And of course, <laughs> they both put in world-class goals in the same game to sink England. What was worse, I then went outside afterwards, completely crestfallen, obviously, as an England supporter, um, out into the night, realising suddenly that I was still wearing an England shirt, and it was Sant Antonio, <laughs> which is the... The night of the year in Lisbon, the sardine festival, everybody in the streets, and the party went on until early the next morning. And guess who got a great deal of attention from the locals that night? <laughs> <laughs> I will never forget That's great. it. That's great. That's so Never great. forget it. Sorry, Danny, just to just to go back to the actual Yeah, role, go ahead. Uh, that, uh, that Portugal were 2-0 down, but they'd actually been playing really well. And I think that's w one thing which... Uh, impressed me most about this game is Portugal didn't panic at all. They didn't panic and they continued to just play their game, play their game. And they just really just overwhelmed Portugal with the quality of their play. But that goal you talk about, I urge anyone who's watching this to who hasn't seen it, or even if you have seen it, to go again. And if you can, watch the whole lead up to that goal, because it is absolutely incredible. You're right, the finish, you know, brilliant Cross, brilliant diving header from you know from so far out. I think how did he, how can he beat Seaman from there? But the the actual leader to the goal, I think it's it's literally about ninety seconds with Portugal just zipping the ball about, passing it from flank to flank, from side to side. England just can't you know they're literally chasing shadows, 
and it culminates with that brilliant goal. And so, yeah, it's probably probably one of my all-time favourite goals for that. And I urge urge you to get the chance, watch it right from the, the start to finish. You know, in this in this tournament also it was the beginning of, and I think Tom, you mentioned it. It's they have uh, Portugal. This last song has not missed a major tournament since. Uh, this is yeah. the run. You know, they missed out on ninety eight um, uh, in qualifying for ninety eight, and then from here on out, uh, Portugal has made every major tournament uh, since then. So um, it wasn't meant to be. Obviously, uh, with this golden generation, uh, it'll always be remembered as a what if um, with with these group of players, but. This tournament was obviously a, a an introduction, a formal introduction uh, to just how good uh, that group of players was. Um, we go to 2004 now, and obviously 2004, you can't think of 2004 without the word heartbreak, and it's exactly what it was. Um, hosting the tournament, which by all accounts um, to that point uh, was a smashing success on all parts uh, for the country and for the federation. Um you know, uh, fans from all, all 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 over Europe came away with uh, a lot of glowing, um, a lot of glowing, uh, you know, thoughts of Portugal as a host nation, and um, obviously what the the Slesson did to get to the final. And obviously, if you guys haven't read the book, they lost in two thousand four. I hate to spoil it <laughs> for you guys, but <laughs> I know, but um. Yeah, Damn it, Danny. I know. I apologize. I've ruined. I've ruined the entire episode now. I apologize. <laughs> but um, you know the way it started and the way it ended it was similar with uh, with a loss to Greece. But the, you know that that opening loss to Greece kind of changed the way the Sles song would look for the next, I would say, maybe de- almost decade with you know inserting Ronaldo into the lineup and you know a a that you could see the 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 passing of the torch kind of beginning uh with uh with a player like uh Luis Figue who would you know who would still be around in, in 06 which would be his last tournament but you could see the the kind of transition beginning to start and and Nathan I'll, I'll bring you in on, on this to start off here um you know this is right around the time that you're you know you're you're being exposed to uh, the Portuguese national team what part of uh, of this team and then in 06 obviously what part of it started kind of lighting your fires on on not only following this team but uh, but just being a fan of it as well? Well, I actually I actually missed out completely on 04, unfortunately. Um, but but I'll but I'll add, I guess that um, you know when I got into you know watching the cell sound, watching football in general in 06, you know I immediately became aware of you know how just how good this team was by you know people bringing up the fact that they had come so close in 04 and then looking into that that tournament more just um i think it added a lot of fuel at the time for me to like figure out you know how this this small country was able to achieve such results you know i mean because the, the way they played in 04 you know was not like a lot of people are accustomed to today you know with with the way that we won year 2016 and, and afterwards, you know, the style of football was really compelling. And I'll, and I'll tell you, you know, looking ahead to 06, you know, I'm, I'm wearing the jersey, you know, from 06. That, you know, that was what had, had people fall in love with Portugal was that style of play, you know. And so, but I think that really uh, 04 was, was arguably, uh, you know, maybe on par with 2000 when they were at their peak of just their, their technical abilities you know the the tactical side was it was interesting they really did look like brazil there was at times there was the tactical side maybe wasn't all there but but the just the unbelievable technical brilliance these players you know was evident in every match and um you know made the difference in the matches that counted uh to get us to the final and then you know revealing the most significant a lack of of focus being in in contests with physical opponents and we did not sort that out for another, you know, more than a decade. You know, I engaged in the, of duels with with teams that were not are better, maybe on paper, but they knew how to beat us by grinding us down. And we and after that point, we we saw years and years of struggles and qualifying for tournaments with these opponents that would would sit deep and just knock us off the ball and force us to make dumb mistakes and take advantage of it. You know. So it really it was kind of like a uh, almost like a, a prophecy or, or an omen of, of things to come for a while. And luckily, 
it didn't stay that way, you know. We <laughs> You know, it was rough there for a while, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, a little bit, a little bit. Tom, uh, Tom and Simon, as 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 folks who were living in Portugal at the time, what was the? And Tom, I'll, I'll start with you on this. What was the the lead up to 2004 as being a host nation? Um, oh, uh, you know, uh, new new stadiums were being built, um, and, and you know, having the world of European football coming to Portugal. Well, what was that like as being uh, someone who was who was living in the in the country at the time, and 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 what were, what was your uh, what was your take of uh, of the tournament um, as a whole? Yeah, well, the you know Portugal is a football crazy country, and so uh, you know when the when the when they were actually I remember the day actually that Portugal won the vote, and they were unexpected you know to get awarded a tournament that Spain were very strong favourites. And so you could say that was Portugal's first victory over Spain at Euro 2004, was actually winning the right to host a tournament. And so, yeah, people were really excited. You know, these brand spanking new stadiums, state-of-the-art stadiums, you know, I think actually like Portugal tends to do sometimes, they just go a little bit over the top and <laughs> just uh, made, you know, more tournaments than was necessary, to be honest. I think everyone recognises that now. But, you know, the... Uh, the brilliant venues obviously to watch the games and uh, and then the, I mean Simon gave a, a, a vivid description there of a uh, Noite de Santo Antonio uh, in Portugal on that that famous uh, night when uh, Portugal beat England in uh, 2000 this this tournament I sometimes say I've been living here now for 25 years and I think it was probably my 25 or 26 or 27 however many days it was favorite days in Portugal it was it was like Santo Antonio every night <laughs> <laughs> it was absolutely amazing you know people just got completely caught up in the excitement of it uh, especially of course once Portugal started doing well after that that shock opening defeat I mean I remember for instance my in-laws who uh, were were not really uh, very into football at all you know they always very polite, of course, and like to talk to me about football because they knew how much I liked it, but they weren't really that into it. But uh, they were almost hitting the 90s at this stage. And I remember uh, my father and all, especially getting, you know, having fervent conversations with me, speaking about, you know, what how Scolari should be an example for Portuguese people, you know, to be more enthusiastic about, about things and what they're capable of, of achieving. So, uh, yeah, and then the whole atmosphere was really, it was really captivating. I mean, we had these these amazing images. I'm sure you saw Danny of, uh, for instance, it became popular to put flags in in your windows, and so you know, flags and scarves and the colours of the national team. So you had these whole kind of you know streets all over the country with you know the red and the green and the and the, and the yellow and just uh, just uh, you know it's, it really was like a a free a free week long festival. So, and of course, in typical Portugal fashion, you know, it ended in absolute heartbreak. <laughs> and uh, uh, which, uh, although I do think kind of looking at the, at the bigger picture, you know, this was definitely, I think this went a little bit beyond football. And I think it did change Portugal a little bit because like you mentioned before, you know, people really spoke glowingly, glowingly about what a good job Portugal had done and they'd been so, uh, you know, perfect hosts and, uh, you know, a lot of people, thousands, tens of thousands of people had come from all over Europe and, and all over the world, you know, to be in a tournament and it kind of almost signalled Portugal as a, you know, a modern country, whereas, you know, they'd always fought really as much, fought themselves to be, you know, a little bit kind of behind everyone else. And so, yeah, from that point of view, you know, it was a, it was a, it was, you know, a huge success, and and even from the football point of view, you know, despite that tragic ending, uh, you know, it gave us some great memories. Simon, you were you were five years into your uh, to your residence in Portugal. What was uh, what was the difference for you uh, from uh, from two thousand and uh, to two thousand four? Were you still wearing the England shirt? No, I I developed a proper <laughs> bond with Portugal by that stage. It doesn't take long uh, to form a bond with this country because it is a fabulous country. Uh, and everything about it is is just so easy on the heart. Um, so it's it's not difficult, and it's not a long process to fall in love with Portugal and the Portuguese pe people and their cultures. And I think Tom made a good point there that 2004 was actually 
uh, the legacy was for the nation rather than the football team or as well as the football team because people um, came to Portugal in their droves for the first time in many cases and swore to the last man that they'd be back for more because they discovered a country that was welcoming, um, was calm, was peaceful. Uh, we had thousands and thousands of football fans from different countries mingling without a, a single problem. That was the astonishing thing for me. There, were, there was talk beforehand, the usual talk of hooligans coming and, and mass fighting, etc. There was nothing. The, the atmosphere just overcame that because everybody was so welcoming and it was just such a happy place to be um, that that was out of the question. You know, there was no question of any any skullduggery or shenanigans going on. It was just just too too nice an occasion for that to, to spoil it. The football was great. Um, the stadia were great as well. Far too many of them, of course, but um, we, we brought national team football to Aveiro and to Liria and to Coimbra, um, slightly unnecessarily, I think, in my opinion. But um, nevertheless, it was spread across the country, properly spread across the country, and the fervour spread from one end to the other as well. Uh, so the legacy was was for the for the nation as well as the football team this time. Absolutely fabulous to be a part of that. We're talking with uh, Simon Curtis, Nathan Motes, and Tom Cunder. They are the authors of the 13th chapter from Uzebu to Ronaldo, Portugal's 50-year journey from football minnows to European champions. We'll, uh, we'll talk about how you can get yourself and win a copy of uh, this uh, awesome, awesome uh, historical look back at uh, the Celeste Sans 50-year journey here uh, at, the end of this, uh, at the end of this episode. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to discuss with – with the three of you here, uh, but more importantly, uh, not more importantly, but uh, specifically with Simon and, and with Tom, uh, they get the, they get the, uh, the loss or they, they receive the loss to Greece. They, ch uh, Scolari changes up a lot of the lineup uh, going forward. Um, they beat Russia. They get the all important win against Spain uh, on that, on that just unbelievable goal by noon Gomes to get them to the knockout stages. Um, I'll go to the semifinal first where that goal by Manish <laughs> to this day is one of my favorites as well. A goal that on television you almost missed <laughs> because of, yes. of how they of how it was edited and how the the cameras were uh were, were showing other replays but um you know I, I have friends that you know we have a huge uh we have a huge population of of Portuguese uh, immigrants uh, here in California where where I'm broadcasting from. Uh, a lot of my uh, my friends were fortunate enough to be at the quarterfinal against England. What was that match like for you know for those that you have spoken with that were at the game? For those uh, of of you who not only you know lived it but you know talked to others who who lived it. What was what was the takeaway from that iconic match uh, against England that saw of all people? Picard winning or uh, scoring the game-winning PK to send Portugal to the semis. Uh, what, what was what was the atmosphere like after that match? Well, I was there that night. I was in I was in the Estadio de Luz for oh. that one. Um, quite inc incredible, incredible in, in every aspect. There must have been about sixty thousand England fans in there. It was incredible, um, and what a game! Just just high drama from start to finish. Um, Injuries, goals scattered here and there, and then to, to finish it off with the two goalkeepers facing up to each other, just extraordinary. And to pour out into the streets afterwards, again, as an Englishman, still coming to terms with what bloody Portugal kept doing to us in, in <laughs> final <laughs> tournaments. It's just amazing. People hanging out of windows, crying, waving flags. And this is partly what Scol Scolari had done. He said, you know, come on, Portugal. Come on, Portuguese nation. Stand up for your, for your boys now. Wave the flag, shout till you drop, and get these guys over the line, and that's what happened. You know, it was, it was a, a coming together, just just a, a a forceful event, incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's second all of that. I, I was in the stadium as well, lucky enough to be with my wife, and uh, I remember it was it was quite a, a roller coaster of emotions. I remember Simon there mentioning it seemed like there were sixty thousand English people in that in that stadium. I remember at one stage, 
because of course England uh, were leading for for a lot of that match. Uh, they were singing, you know, really were making a lot of noise for all the criticism English fans get. I think the true English fans, you know, not the not the unsavoury element, the true English fans, they're fantastic supporters and they really are well known for the, for the vocal support they give to their team. And I remember one of their chants was, uh, you're supposed to be at home. They were singing <laughs> that. And uh, But I tell you what, when Rui Costa uh, smacked oh. in that equalising goal, uh, you could tell who was the home team. <laughs> you yes. could tell yeah, who I was bet. the home team. I don't think I've ever heard such a roar as that. Uh, you know, I think it was obviously the situation. I think there was, what, seven, eight minutes left. Uh, no, no, it's extra time, wasn't it? It was extra time. It was the goal which put Portugal ahead. Uh, you know, people actually believed this was going to happen. And uh, the the noise, you know, that was obviously his home stadium as well, Benfica Stadium. And uh, Paul Ricochta himself, you know, such a popular player to score such a majestic goal like that. And uh, that, that, that the amount of noise that that uh, generated when that ball rocketed into the back of the net is really something which which stuck with me. But uh, but yeah, little did we know that the, the drama was only was only starting really at that stage. And uh, yeah, Ricardo, I mean, what can you say about Ricardo? That was just, uh, you know, something about England-Portugal matches, wasn't it? I mean, 2000 was an incredible game. I think this, this may have even topped it. And there was another link, Tom, if you remember the score of the first goal in that 2004 uh, game. Unbelievable. Yeah. Here I was doing my punditry uh, <laughs> stuff again. <laughs> telling everyone, held a Postiga, please. <laughs> if, if he's playing up front against England, you have absolutely nothing to worry about. Bang, <laughs> in it goes. I thought, oh, yeah. oh look, it's Postiga scored. I do not believe it. <laughs> of course, it's been, it's been that previous season at Tottenham Hotspur where, um, if memory serves me right, I think it managed to uh, accumulate the grand total of one goal in the whole season. Nope. He scored and two the, goals, and I know uh, this because they were both against Manchester City, which is my team. <laughs> Absolutely extraordinary record yeah. he had. Two goals in England, <laughs> one in the league, one yeah. in the League Cup, and both against City. Extraordinary. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, leading up, leading up to you know, obviously the the euphoria of uh, Ricardo scoring the goal is one thing. As being as being at the stadium, what are you guys thinking when you're seeing him? go up to take a pk and i mean what what is i one he he saved the the previous and i forget who the who the the penalty taker was um Vassal. Vassal. yeah yeah but, and, but he was he was already without gloves so he's uh, he's already premeditated that uh, i'm going to take this but yeah. as he's now walking to the spot with a chance to send portugal to the semifinals what are you guys thinking seeing this at the stadium well, you can't make it more dramatic, basically. Can you think of anything else to, to script this with that would make it more weird, more dramatic, more dripping in drama than that? I don't think so. Well, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, and is all goalkeepers are a bit crazy, aren't they? They say you have to be crazy to be a goalkeeper. But uh, uh, I'm sure I didn't think this at the time. But, you know, look, if I'd, if I'd seen Ricardo, I think, my, you know, I was just... My head was just whirling with so many sure. emotions. But if you'd seen, if you see that, you know, the footage of that, the way Ricardo just picks up that ball, you know, puts it on the spot, you know, steps back a few uh, for his runner, just runs up. It's just, it's just like he's in another dimension. And there was no way he was going to miss that penalty. And if you look at that penalty, that is just the perfect penalty, the absolutely perfect penalty, hard, low, like a bullet, right into the corner. Absolutely no way, no cook, any goalkeeper is going to say that. You know, so, ba yeah. based on the based on the camera angle that uh, that we were uh, we were given on the feed here in the states, I thought he missed it at first because the net didn't even move at first, and then and then he's I, I see him like go crazy, and I'm like, did he just make that? Are we going to the semifinals? And sure enough, I mean, all of a sudden you see the the, the, the team just going crazy on the field. Um, as euphoric as that was, <laughs> let's let's bring the reality back to it. Uh, two matches later, they failed to score against Greece. They lose to Greece. And in one of the biggest upsets still to this day in international football, um, you, you can argue um, that, you know, it's up there with Portugal's victory in, uh, two, in 2016 against France in France. But um, what was the what was the reaction like to 
the absolute just disappointment and heartbreak of getting so far, getting to the final, being the host, and and having it just not fall their way um, in the in the final. Yeah, it was it was terrible. You know, just the whole country just went into mourning for a while. Although I'd say it didn't last that long because. You know, like I said, I think people were just so proud of what the country had achieved uh, with the tournament as a whole. And, you know, Portuguese people, what can you say? Uh, if you know Portuguese culture and, you know, Sebastianismo and kind of this, this, you know, they're even so proud of the word soldads, aren't they? Which is kind of, you know, this sad, melancholy feeling of, uh, you know, something you miss or, you know, just something which you know, isn't quite in your grasp. And that just kind of summed it up, didn't it? So, uh, so yeah, I suppose in a way, you know, if you're, if you were kind of scripting it uh, for, you know, the perfect Portuguese ending or the archetypal Portuguese ending, uh, I think that's the way you'd script it. So, yeah, it was, you know, obviously just very disappointing. It was a big drop off though, Tom, wasn't it? Because before the game, the, the build up was, almost euphoric to start oh, with. I, I, I got a feeling absolutely. that the yeah. the wave of enthusiasm was so large that they they couldn't lose this one. You know, this was going to be the occasion that they finally made the big, big breakthrough. So when it didn't happen, yes, the, the Saudades and the Melancholia and the Fado and everything else came flooding back in in large amounts. But beforehand, I just remember the, the, the team was preparing an Alcachet at Sporting's uh, training area. And when they got on the bus and crossed the River Tejum and they came across Vasco da Gama Bridge, oh, I was welling up. I'm welling up now thinking about it as an Englishman in Portugal. The thousands of motorbikes, flying flags and little cars, everybody tooting horns, the camera panned from the helicopter into the river. There were thousands of boats in the river, flying flags and everybody heading wow towards the Stadio de Luz for the final. Yeah. It was just an it's overwhelming, so overwhelming yeah. feeling of let's do this. You know, unbelievable. The whole nation willing them forward. So such a shame that it uh, that it didn't turn out properly yeah. for them. The, the Segunda Circular, which is kind of the, you know, the fast road, the bypass, which goes from the Vasco da Gama Bridge, goes all the way right to the stadium, the Stadio de Luz Stadium. So it's kind of, you know, free lane either side, very fast uh, road, although quite often a car park, but that's another different story. <laughs> but, uh, that was literally, <clears throat> you know, I think, I, I'm not even sure if people can normally get access to it or was probably prohibited, you know, because it's quite a dangerous road, but that was just packed, uh, I'd say about three or four or five uh, rows of people all the way along, like Simon said, everyone decked out in the colours, everyone, uh, you know, waving flags. The the coach had to go quite slowly, you know, because there were so many people about. So, really, it was, yeah, just uh, you know, it, it was really at the peak of, of euphoria. Yeah, it, it, you know, as someone who you know, I, I've been I've been to you know, my folks are from the Azores, so I've not ever been to Portugal proper. But um, <clears throat> you know, again, having the big community of Portuguese immigrants here uh, in uh, in California, just the the you know, uh, Simon, I think you put it best, just the anticipation and, and the, we're going to do this and it, and just the air being sucked out of, and that's not very Portuguese. Let's face it. You know, the, no, the, not the, at the, all. The Portuguese approach to thing is, is we're not going to do this and it's, it's going to be a shit of an occasion. Um, <laughs> we'll, we'll come through of it. We'll come through it. Okay. And um, we'll enjoy the tears afterwards because that's uh, salty tears are quite a nice taste for us. But that time it was completely different. You know, it felt like there was a bit of a release going on. Scolari had pumped everybody up. Um, so it was even more of a shame in a way because the Portuguese were, were trying their best to escape themselves in, in some, some ways. You know, and, and you mentioned Scolari and, and, and it's, a, it's a perfect transition to go to, to 06 here where even though the, the championship and the, and the tournament was not won uh, in 04, um, it was this team was so positioned so nicely to build off of 2004 and, and Nathan this is where you know your love affair with this with this national team begins here and you know just a, a quick uh, recap they beat Angola they beat the eventual champions uh Italy and uh then they beat Mexico in group play uh they beat the Netherlands in what had to be 
one of the most physical and card tasty <laughs> matches we've ever seen. Um, you know, then then Ronaldo got something in his eye. I couldn't against I don't know, got something in his eye against England. Uh again, PK's uh, uh penalties are, are are the decider there uh with Portugal uh you know getting uh, getting the best of the English again and then losing to Zidane, to Zidane once again in uh in the semifinals uh against France. This team to me is what the world of football present day fell in love with. And I think is it's kind of the beginning with 04 as well, but kind of like the beginning of this, obviously this Ronaldo era of the national team, but you know, Portugal now is on the tip of everyone's tongue in, you know, the top, you know, five, six squads in the nation. And it kind of started in this era. Uh, Nathan, like for you um, with this, with this squad being the squad that brought you to your, you know, your in- introduction to this, to this national team, um, what were your thoughts of uh, of them in this tournament and, and how uh, and how the tournament played out for them? Yeah, well, so I, I didn't go into this tournament expecting to fall in love with Portugal. That's that's one thing I want to you know kind of make clear that that wasn't uh, how I thought that was going to go down. I just wanted to see a, a good soccer tournament, and um, you know <laughs> that's the American way of thinking of that, you know. And and I think that uh, you know watching Ronaldo and, and Portugal play. Uh, was was something special. It was it was a love affair that was meant to be. That's all I can say. You know, watching the way that they they played in in the, in the group stage in particular, and then um, you know the battle in Nuremberg. You know, I I kind of wish there's parts of me that wish wishes that wasn't a part of our history, but I because I, it was such a you know contentious affair, Ronaldo getting kicked out of the game, you know, like that. But I think it's it's appropriate because you know we learned to battle. Kind of in that in that game, we finally learned to have you know the the physical duel that we needed to have. And even though that wasn't the final lesson that we needed uh, to go ahead and and go forward and win a tournament, I think it was an important addition of some steel to go along with you know some of the finesse that that we were we were playing with at that tournament. You know, voted the most entertaining team. That wasn't a hard decision, frankly. You know, no, not at all. You know, we were great at that tournament. Ronaldo only missed out on the on the uh, best young player to, to Lucas Podolski, in my opinion, because he just didn't score enough goals. But that was one of the things about Ronaldo was so exciting. It was he would beat, you know, all these different players. He'd hit the post, you know, he'd miss, you know, and it was it was just drama. It was just it was just scintillating drama. And, and people don't understand that about football a lot of times. You know, it's uh, you know part of the drama of, of the game is the near misses. It's the oh, if they only would have made the pass then instead of you know instead of when they actually did, you know, that's a part of the, uh, the excitement that I wasn't familiar with not being a, a football supporter at all. So watching Portugal do it, you know, there is no nation like Portugal to squander chances. And it, <laughs> it was just phenomenal. It was edge your seat kind of stuff all the time. And, uh, you know, obviously disappointing uh, into that, but, you know, from emotionally, you know, I have to say, you know, it's a value judgment an emotional value judgment. Uh, which is the greatest team to ever win. And for me, it's 06, you know, just because that was that was my introduction. Such a beautiful squad, you know, uh, in my opinion, greatest player in Portugal's history uh, in, the, in the squad. You know, Luis Figo coming out of retirement just to be a part of that. Uh, Ricardo Cavallo, you know, being in the, in the team, one of Portugal's uh, best defenders. You know, you have, you have Deco, who uh, at the time, you know, was was kind of the last of the, the kind of the glittering era of the number 10 to space. So, a lot, a lot of good stuff there that I could wax poetic about for a long time, uh, but uh, but a great memories, wonderful tournament, and uh, man, I, I wish they would have, uh, I wish they would have had their opportunity against uh, against Italy. Yeah, me too. Uh, you know, the one thing that I came uh, that came across too, which began in 04, was the passion that Luis Felipe Scolari showed on the sidelines, and that that became evident. And uh, Tom and Simon, as you guys mentioned, it kind of it kind of lit the fire to the nation in 04 and that carried over to 06. Uh, there's, and, and I forget which game it was. I think it was the England game in 2004 where Scolari has both the Portuguese flag and the Brazilian flag. And he's, he's kissing both flags and he's touching it to his chest. And, and that's something that I think also helped spotlight not only the way that Portugal was being looked at on a national, on a national stage, because, you know, we had we had the players, but we also had the the manager uh, who had the success with Brazil prior and and, and was now manning the uh, the uh, the reins 
with uh, with Portugal. But uh, you know, he is, and I'd have to check, but I believe he's the only manager to go to have multiple semifinals appearances at the at the helm of uh, of Portugal. I'd have to check. Um, but what is what is Scolari's legacy, uh, Simon and Tom, in the annals of of uh, of Portuguese managers? Because up until Fernand Sanch, he's obviously the most successful in terms of victories, but um, he brought so much more than just the the victories on uh, on the pitch. I think he, you know, as someone who was not from Portugal, even though it's you know, uh, from Brazil, they speak the same language, but he brought a passion to a national team that was not his nation that was infectious. And I think that to me is more of his legacy uh, with this national team than just what happened on the pitch. What do you guys think of, uh, of uh, Philippon's uh, uh, legacy? Yeah, I think, I think also there's another very important point here, which we kind of <clears throat> t touched on uh, in our previous discussions or our discussions of previous tournaments was this whole uh, kind of, uh, you know, really toxic rivalry between Portugal's three biggest clubs and that kind of spills over into the national team as well and uh, Scolari I think one big advantage he had and I don't know if this was actually purposely done by the uh, the president of the you know the Portuguese FBF at the time to get someone from abroad precisely to avoid these problems uh, was that he he really didn't uh, you know he didn't care about that he didn't care about it he didn't take sides or at least you know uh, obviously you'd have a lot of press speculation and some people I know at the time I think some of the Porto kind of fan base thought he was a bit anti-Porto because uh, especially because of course Vito Bahia was kind of dropped uh, suddenly without a trace but he I think the fact that he was from outside it kind of cut through that it kind of cut through all of that uh, you know silliness in a way and he he did bring the you know the nation together and uh, I remember speaking to, you know, speaking to Ricardo and speaking to uh, uh, to uh, some of the players around that time, to uh, also Nuno Gomes and also uh, Fernando Meira, who we interviewed for 2006. They they talk about this kind of family uh, family type close close knit atmosphere which he generated within the squad, and he said that for the first time almost that, that they could remember or especially when they'd spoken to their uh, you know to their elders or to former players you know the players really look forward to the seller sound really look forward to the get-togethers you know even the qualifiers even the friendlies and that was you know that might sound a simple thing but that wasn't the case in the past because as we discussed you know you had this kind of uh, quite a tense atmosphere you know at best uh, and so I think he completely kind of almost was like a breath of fresh air. You know, he kind of swept that away or just ignored it and just picked players on merit or, uh, or, or perhaps, you know, picked players which he thought was were best for generating that kind of atmosphere and that kind of environment. And, uh, and it, you know, the, the players just responded. You know, I've, one thing I always think is incredible about the Scolari era is you've got quite a few players there, I'd say, players like Manish, for example, players like Nuno Valente, for example, who I think probably played better for Portugal than they ever played for their club sides, you know, yeah. which is outstanding, always. And I think you have to give a lot of credit uh, for that to Scolari. Yeah, it was, it, Philippe Powell was a bit, a bit of a bully as well, wasn't he? He, he brought uh, <laughs> other characteristics to the, to the Portuguese football scene, that just didn't exist. Uh, so I think he 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 made it more multi-dimensional. Uh, there was a bit more self-assurance about them, as Tom said. The players looked forward to the get-togethers, looked forward to the next game because they they had that self-confidence. There was some of that um, typical Portuguese uncertainty of how it's going to pan out had been eroded away by him because he was a big physical presence. He was quite happy to bluster in front of the microphones and say how good everyone was and what we were going to do to them, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that um, that played an important part in, in the team behaving and the squad behaving and the mentality changing um, so that it sort of built up to, to a, a new level of confidence, I think. 
Yeah. yeah. So, so, sorry, sorry, Danny, just one of the yeah, things, you, you kind of jogged my memory there, Simon. I remember speaking to Ricardo and it was interesting because he said that it was a conscious effort on Scolari's part. You know, it was a real conscious effort to build this kind of environment and this tight knit group. And he said sometimes, you know, he's got this reputation and probably deserved these so for being kind of sergeant major, you know, Philippe Pound, this, you know, big bully, like Simon said. But he said sometimes the players, they realized and they knew that he did that kind of as a show, you know, for the media. And they said they sometimes joked among themselves and they laughed among themselves, you know, and they said, oh, you know, tomorrow the paper's going to be full of this, you know, Ricardo uh, Scolari has been shouting at whatever, has been shouting at the linesman, been shouting, you know, at the referee, has been shouting at, a, a, you know, a journalist or whatever. And he did that. But, but he, like, you know, I think he, we have to give him uh, a lot of credit because he showed intelligence in doing that purposely. You know, it wasn't just his kind of, his characteristic, he did that purposely to build this atmosphere. You know, and, and finally here, as we, as we finish off the, uh, the, the semifinalists, um, you know, again, we're, we're talking about which team we feel is the greatest Portuguese side to not win a, a major tournament as I am reading it right from the bottom there to help me out. Um, we go to Euro 2012 and Nathan, again, we'll, we'll go to you here. Um, you wrote about the 2012 squad. I think of the six teams that we've discussed here, there's not a lot, in my opinion, that we remember too much of this 2012 team. Um, you know, we saw the emergence of players uh, like uh, João Moutinho, and for a, a brief instance, uh, you know, uh, you know the debut of uh, Fabio Quintrão at left back. But uh, obviously, this is where uh, on the European stage, uh, Ronaldo definitely uh, made his presence felt, especially in, in in the group stage. The the performance he had against the Netherlands to to get Portugal into the knockout stage was was uh, was uh, unworldly, but um, talk to me about this 2012 team because I, I don't think enough is talked about on this one. Uh, and, and I think you know, you know Paul Bint, that was his one and only uh, uh, shot in, in the in the semifinals. Not a real memorable reign as as Portuguese national team manager. But what are your thoughts on the 2012 squad? Yeah, you know it borrows from a lot of different elements that we've already discussed. So. A little bit like the 66 tournament, there was very little squad change throughout. That was one of Pinto's hallmarks was there was a, there was a, you know, a, a starting 11 and that was, that was it. That wasn't going to change much. And that ended up kind of contributing to our undoing similar to 66 and then similar to 84. You know, I, I feel like this group of players, uh, I, I refer to them as the forgotten generation in the book because I, I really, when I look at the squad, I get the fact that some people point out that there were, there were certainly better players in certain positions of different eras. And there's, there's no, no real contest there, but I'll add just some, some caveats to that. You know, Joao Moutinho is going to go down. as probably one of the finest players in Portugal's midfield ever, you know, a, a member of the eventual Euro 2016 squad. You know, he was there. Pepe, arguably the greatest uh, defender in Portugal's history uh, was there. Uh, and then Cristiano was was at his peak in that tournament. And then you have Nani, who also played a, a key role four years later for Portugal. So this this wasn't necessarily a squad that was lacking quality. They did not have a great reputation, though. And and part of that was because of, you know, their difficulties in qualification, you know, which you know, we won't, won't get into all that. But, you know, that was kind of in the, in the background. When I talked to people uh, on the ground in Ukraine, because I covered that tournament in person, uh, you know, there was little belief there that, that almost everyone said, you know, hey, I just kind of wanted to be a part of the Euros. I'm, I'm, I'm not thinking Portugal are going to are going to do anything. You know, they were in the, the group of death with Germany and the Netherlands, who had just come off the uh, the World Cup 2010 final appearance in which many felt they probably should have won were it not for just an amazing save by Iker Castillas in, in, in the latter stages of that match uh, from Ian Robin. And so that squad had only been defeated once in qualification. You know, Germany was phenomenal. Um, and, and then we had Denmark as well, who, who gave us a lot of problems. So just getting out of the group seemed really difficult. And then, uh, as you pointed out, that that match with the Netherlands uh, that I, I was able to bear witness to was just, I think, was just a... Uh, just an exemplification of what they were, what they were capable of. And, and really what I'll say, I guess, in conclusion is that that team... I think was had every bit the same potential to win a major tournament as, as some of the the ones that that were a bit more 
glamorous, you know, from 04, 06, 2000. I mean, we came so close to, to knocking out uh, what was probably the best Spanish team of all time, you know, at their peak. And had we done that, I like our odds against Italy in, in the final, you know. And, and so, obviously, no one knows how that would have gone down. But but for me, this this squad, this team was compelling in that era. Um, and and just the uh, the qualification that came before and then their eventual performances after Euro 2012, notwithstanding, they were excellent in this tournament. They were they were very good, and and just being there in the stadium, um, the uh, the unity they had and just the belief that they had was was really evident. I got to speak to the players, you know, in person, and um, there there was they had something, you know, and it's a disappointment to me that they were unable to complete that uh, that tournament with the win as well. But you know that that had been the history of Portugal to that point, and um, and I think we we borrowed some of the lessons from that and ended up you know applying them. Four years later, so uh, not all, not all lost, I suppose. Absolutely, uh, yeah, and uh, obviously the the glory finally came in uh, in 2016. So, um, real quick, uh, let's let we've gone through everything, and I greatly appreciate everyone's time because we've we've been at it here uh, at it here for uh, a while. And uh, and Nathan, I know that you have to uh, to bounce here, uh, so I'll start with you uh, of the semifinalists and the one final uh, finalist, I should say, that we discussed. 66, 84, 2000, 2004, 2006, and 2012. Of those six, who do you feel? And I think you mentioned it before, but just to reiterate, who do you think is the is the best uh, is the greatest Portugal side not to win a major tournament? Yeah, it's it's those six for me. You have the uh, you know kind of the the duo of you know say Portugal is maybe second or third greatest player in Figo. Mixed with their greatest ever player, Ronaldo. You have Deco. You have you have an unbelievable defensive assembly, iconic performances, a best uh, most entertaining team, and and really the one I feel that introduced Portugal to the international audience in a much bigger way. You know, so I I really see that the the growth of the interest in Portuguese football. Uh, worldwide attributed more, at least in America, I would say, maybe to, to, to narrow it down, is attributed more to that uh, 2006 tournament than any other. Um, and you know, you could debate about why exactly that is, but they they were um, they were in their element in that tournament. It was a special time for for Portugal. Um, you know, obviously an emotional you know, memory for me. You know, but um, that that was my favorite. They were the greatest. I think they um, they were unlucky. You know, against France, um, and you know, against against Italy. You know, it's, there's never any opportunity to to know what would have happened. They were the greatest for me. Tom, what about you? of uh, Of the uh, teams we've discussed, who's your uh, who is your uh, your favorite there? Yeah, lots of uh, you know, fantastic potential. You can make good arguments for all of them, can't you? But for me, I'm going for 2000. I just think that was the. For me, the team which played the most scintillating football, it was the golden generation or Figo and Rui Costa, especially really at the height of their powers. And they just played super brilliant football. I think perhaps the reason they didn't get over the line was because it was kind of the first time they were in that situation. Those particular players, you know, with a with, with a chance, but they, you know, just look at their careers and the, just the, the football they played. Like I said, that game against England, look at that first goal uh, or the Joel Pinto goal and the lead up to it. It's just absolutely incredible and all over the pitch. I mean, just look at a midfield. If you picked a Portuguese all-time great, uh, you know, throughout the history of Portugal, you, you probably have Rui uh, Figo, perhaps Rui Costa, and uh, and probably Paulo Sousa as well. And they were all part of those. And then, of course, the Vitor Bahia at the back, you had uh, Nuno Gomes just uh, exploding at the front. And, uh, yeah, I just think it was a really rounded team. But above all, the scintillating football they played, I think it's a real shame they didn't translate their uh, World Youth Cup triumphs into an actual, you know, triumph on, on the senior stage. Simon, uh, you know, as as someone who uh, I think wrote the the most interesting chapter of, of this, uh, of this uh, journey here, I think I know where you're going, but who uh, who would you think is the uh, is the this best less on team to never win? A, well, it's very kind uh, of you, Danny, to say that. Um, I really wanted to be obtuse because it's something that that feels sits nicely with me and and go for eighty four. 
uh, for the reasons that I stated uh, earlier, but I think Nathan's uh, argument for 2006 is beginning to sway me. If we could club 2004 and 2006 together as a, a generational thing, I think that's probably the, the era where the greatest legacy was left altogether. Um, we, we talked at length about what happened in this country during the, the 2004 tournament. Something clicked there, something changed, the relationship between the country and its team, um, the difference in the manager uh, styles that, that uh, we mentioned with uh, Scolari, and moving on to 2006 was, was the end product of that as well. Um, so I probably have to uh, agree with Nathan. All right, so there you have it. Surprise, surprise. I was about to say, <laughs> I'm glad I don't have to break the tie. Um, for, for me, it was uh, you know I you know recency bias uh, as you know I I would I said that 2006 for me was my favorite team. I don't know if it's the greatest team, but it was my favorite team. Um, you have the history of of what could have been in 2000 um, with this golden generation finally capping off uh, on the senior level a a, a major tournament. And then 84 against Simon, I, I just, you, based on everything that happened behind the scenes, to be able to bring a trophy home in spite of all that would have been one of the greatest stories in the history of football. So, um, you know, for me, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I, not, they're not my children. Uh, I, I can pick one. Uh, it'll be 06, but, um, but, but uh, 2000 and 1984 are definitely right up there with me. So um, I want to thank you guys uh, for, for joining me uh, and, and making this like uh, episode possible. Uh, again, Simon, I, I'm just uh, happy we, I'm finally able to get you on the show and, and, uh, and uh, to connect and, and, and to, you know, to properly introduce myself uh, to you here. Uh, Tom and Nathan have been uh, tremendous supporters of the pod, and I appreciate the support you've given me online as well. So um, we do have a book. It's not this one, unless you want all the tags and the highlights, and unless you want to sign, unless you want to sign copy by by yours truly, uh, please, uh, I'll, I'll send it out. But makes it more valuable. Absolutely, uh, but Tom, uh, you uh, uh, you had the idea of of sending out a a copy of the book um, to our listeners and to to the readers of Portugal.net. And by the way, follow Tom, Nathan, and Simon on on Twitter. Tom is at Portugal one. Nathan is at Nathan Motes and Simon Curtis uh, at Bifana Bifana, a name so nice he wrote it twice. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but Tom, how uh, you know we want to give away a book or a, a copy of the book of uh, the thirteenth chapter. Uh, how do you uh, how do you want to do it, and uh, and uh, how can the listeners and the viewers and your readers uh, participate? Hey, I'm, yeah, a, yeah. No, just real quick, I'm sorry. I'm gonna, I'm gonna step out real quick. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sorry I can't chat more. I, I love. This. I've I've, ta I've taken a lot of your time, Nathan. So it's it's completely understandable, man. That's all good. I, have, I I love I love this. I hope we get to do it again soon. Uh, sorry, you and me, Tom. We can't go to the the Euros. I I'm, I'm really yeah. suffering over that. But uh, anyway, great discussion. Great seeing y'all. Uh, Force to sell a sal. And I hope I see y'all again soon. Sorry, I gotta run. It's Cheers, nice, bud. Thank you, Cheers, bud. Nice, you're well, nice one. Yeah. All right. Uh, All, right. All right. So now that he's gone, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what are you talking just, about? <laughs> actually, just to bring it back to Nathan's point you made earlier on, he made a really good point about the way I think all, you know, and the, the whole book's about this really, is the way that the all tournaments kind of fed into that final victory at last in 2016. I think especially these ones we've talked about when they came so near. And that's uh, why we have here, I think, the, the photo. I just absolutely loved this photo when I first saw it. And fortunately enough, the, uh, the Portuguese Football Federation gave me permission to use it as the cover of the book. Because you see there, <coughs> of course, Eusebio, <coughs> way, way back from 1966. And he kind of shows you, uh, you know, what a figurehead he was, because this is the Portugal team coming back from France in 2016. They just won the European uh, Championship. There's the trophy over there. And they put Eusebio, this big photo of Eusebio at the start, took that picture, absolutely brilliant picture, I think, which tells you so much about the history of Portuguese football. So to win this, uh, yeah, it's just a simple question I'm going to ask. Uh, and uh, may have to force you to sit through and listen to this whole thing again, if you haven't Do it. <laughs> Uh, so we've talked about uh, some of the players that we've interviewed uh, in writing this book. So 
which two players did we interview for the 1966 World Cup and the 2000 European Championship? If you just send uh, those answers to uh, the email, portugal at portugal.net. So that's P-O-R-T-U-G-O-A-L at P-O-R-T-U-G-O-L dot net, portugal.net. Uh, who are the two players that we interviewed? Two Portugal players, one from the 1966 World Cup, one from the 2000 European Championships for the book. But uh, anyway, I'll put this all into the in, in writing when we uh, flag up this show. But that's the question. Okay, so again, the question once again is uh, who was interviewed in the book uh, to discuss the 1966 World Cup and the uh, 2000 European Championship. If you uh, answer that correctly, you have a shot at winning a copy of the 13th chapter, uh, a, a history uh, of Portuguese football that uh, I could read over and over again uh, because it's something that I'm so passionate about. Um, you can see uh, from you know my background here. You can see there's a lot there. Uh, you know, Tom. Uh, Tom's been uh, just a tremendous uh, supporter of uh, of our pod since uh, since we started in, in 2018, and a partnership with him is a dream come true for someone like myself who's doing this from the States and uh, trying to get an English perspective or uh, an English speaking perspective uh, of, uh, of the, uh, of the national team. And, and I can't thank uh, you, Tom, Simon and Nathan uh, enough, uh, not only for the book, but for coming on to discuss uh, the chapters of, uh, of what could have been uh, in Portuguese, uh, in Portuguese soccer, but uh, just uh, a, a huge obrigado from me. And uh, I hope, um, you know, we, we get to do something like this, uh, uh, again soon and uh before before i leave you uh leave you guys here um thoughts on on 2020 or 2021 uh what what are again uh, simon i think you mentioned it it's whenever it's when we don't think it could happen the 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 run happens uh 2018 coming off of 2016 the expectation was so high uh you know going out in the in the round of 16 is is not where we thought the national team would would end up as defending champions, which is the first time this nation was ever going to be in a tournament as defending champions, uh, notwithstanding the Nations League, but that's another that could be another podcast. I can't wait for the Nations League book myself, but that's just me. Um, you know what? What? Uh, what are your thoughts on on the team as it approaches uh, this tournament, which is now just a little bit more than a month away, with the squad being announced in just a few weeks? Well, to put it uh, in few words we don't really know because of what's happened with the pandemic because of um portugal being in the unique situation going in as holders of the tournament holders of the trophy rather um we don't know how that will affect the uh, mentality we know they're strong these days we know this is probably a, a well clearly a better squad than the one that actually won it in 2016 agreed so the the the, the sky's the limit, really. But again, difficult group to get out of. If that can be achieved, then there's nobody to fear, I would say. Um, however, the, the big question mark is is how you deal with the extra pressure of being the one that everybody wants to knock out. Tom, uh, some thoughts on uh, the upcoming tournament? Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. You know, it's gonna, I think it's going to be you know a lot of fun watching it. I think I'm very pleased that Portugal got this group of death because if they've got an easy group, you know, with such an uh, incredible array of talent and uh, an easy group, then we probably all know what the result would have been <laughs> an embarrassing early exit. So yeah, Portugal are going to be have to be really on it from the start. You know, France and Germany in their group, and uh, well. Uh, if they win it or not, I'm not sure because, like Simon alluded to, there's well, anyone you know who's who's watched football attentively recently, the the squad, the Portugal squad, is without doubt one of perhaps their greatest ever, or one certainly one of the strongest in the world at the moment. However, is it the strongest team? You know, uh, 2016 wasn't the strongest squad, and yet that team just gelled and proved to be you know unbeatable. So it all depends if a uh, Fernando Santos can, uh, you know, get the right formula, but certainly looking forward to it. Absolutely. Again, my thanks to uh, to Tom Cundert, Simon Curtis, and Nathan Motes for joining me in uh, in just uh, a a fun discussion as uh, we discussed who we thought is the uh, the best lesson team to never uh, win a major tournament. Uh, the consensus, uh, not consensus, but you know, uh, 2006 looks like it's uh, the uh, the choice here of the pod. 
Tom, I know that bothers you being a 2000 guy, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, that would have been a good choice as well. But, uh, uh honestly, just a, a fun, uh, a fun discussion. And, uh, and again, great to connect with everybody on, uh, on video. It's first time doing this. So I appreciate you guys being, uh, my guinea pigs for this, uh, <laughs> but, uh, and handsome guinea pigs at that. Uh, but, uh, but all the best to you guys stay safe, uh, in Portugal. Uh, and, uh, and I look forward to, uh, to talking with you guys, uh, very, very soon. Okay. Thanks, Danny. Thanks, Thanks very much. Yeah. Cheers guys. Bye -bye. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.